its nuclear forces to the unprecedented alert level of DEFCON 2, next step to nuclear war. On that Saturday, one of the blockading US warships detected Savitsky's submarine and attempted to force it to the surface by dropping low explosive depth charges as warning shots. The submarine had been hiding deep underwater for days. It was out of radio contact, so the crew did not know where the war had already broken out. Conditions on board were extremely bad. It was built for the Arctic, and its ventilator had broken in the tropical water. The heat inside was unbearable, ranging from 45 degrees Celsius near the torpedo tubes to 60 degrees in the engine room. Carbon dioxide had built up to dangerous concentrations, and crew members had begun to fall unconscious. Depth charges were exploding right next to the hull. One of the crew later recalled, It felt like you were sitting in a metal barrel, which somebody is constantly blasting with a sledgehammer. Increasingly desperate, Captain Savitsky ordered his crew to prepare their secret weapon. Maybe the war has already started up there while we are doing somersaults here. We're going to blast them now. We will die, but we will sink them all. We will not disgrace our navy. Firing the nuclear weapon required the agreement of the submarine's political officer, who held the other half of the firing key. Despite the lack of authorization by Moscow, the political officer gave his consent. On any of the other three submarines, this would have sufficed to launch their nuclear weapon. But by the purest luck, submarine B-59 carried the commander of the entire flotilla, Captain Vasily Arkhipov, and so required his additional consent. Arkhipov refused to grant it. Instead, he talked Captain Savitsky down from his rage and convinced him to give up, to surface amidst the US warships and await further orders from Moscow. We do not know precisely what would have happened if Arkhipov had granted his consent, or had he simply been stationed on any of the other three submarines. Perhaps Savitsky would not have followed through on his command. What is clear is that we came precariously close to a nuclear strike on the blockading fleet, a strike which would most likely have resulted in nuclear retaliation, then escalation to a full-scale nuclear war, the only kind the US had plans for. Years later, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense during the crisis, came to the same conclusion. No one should believe that had US troops been attacked by nuclear warheads, the US would have refrained from responding with nuclear warheads. Where would it have ended? In utter disaster. Ever since the advent of nuclear weapons, humans have been making choices with such stakes. Ours is a world of flawed decision makers, working with strikingly incomplete information, directing technologies which threaten the entire future of the species. We were lucky that Saturday in 1962, and have so far avoided catastrophe. But our destructive capabilities continue to grow, and we cannot rely on luck forever. We need to take decisive steps to end this period of escalating risk and safeguard our future. Fortunately, it is in our power to do so. The greatest risks are caused by human action, and they can be addressed by human action. Whether humanity survives this era is thus a choice humanity will make, but it is not an easy one. It all depends on how quickly we can come to understand and accept the fresh responsibilities that come with our unprecedented power. This is a book about existential risks, risks that threaten the destruction of humanity's long-term potential. Extinction is the most obvious way humanity's entire potential could be destroyed. But there are others. If civilization across the globe were to suffer a truly unrecoverable collapse, that too would destroy our long-term potential. And we shall see that there are dystopian possibilities as well, ways we might get locked into a failed world with no way back. While this set of risks is diverse, it is also exclusive. So I will have to set aside many important risks that fall short of this bar, our topic is not new dark ages for humanity or the natural world, terrible though they would be, but the permanent destruction of humanity's potential. Existential risks present new kinds of challenges. They require us to coordinate globally and intergenerationally in ways that go beyond what we've achieved so far, and they require foresight rather than trial and error.